Because you have a... You have another round. Let, 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 I'll say two things about that. One, you got two rounds, so you, you're not done. And two, um, the idea is for you to rate the whole nine weeks, not the two. But you got another round. So... Oh, did, did, hold on, did you just, did you, just, <laughs> isn't that about like three years old? Is it? I'm going to have to tell my wife that I dabbed in class today. <laughs> all right, all right, settle down, let's get started. All right, first off, housekeeping, homework number five. Uh, it's due today. I've got them collected up here on the chair, so if you have not already turned them in, please do so. Uh, homework number six has turned on today. It is not due until after spring break. Um, but after today, you'll have pretty much, I think, yeah, after today, you'll have every skill that you need to complete the assignment. Um, I want to uh, indicate a couple of things to you. First off, on problem number one, Problem number one is actually an Excel-based problem, and um, the idea is for you to, to, uh, to uh, take the uh, uh, AISC column curve and actually plot it in Excel um, for a given yield stress. Um, my advice to you is that if you're handy with Excel, particularly if you use the IF command, it will actually make your life a lot easier because if you um, recall, the AISC column curve is a piecewise function. If your uh, slenderness is less than or equal to 4.71 square root of E over Fy, your curve is computed with this equation. If not, it's computed with that equation. The if curve, it, it's not completely necessary. You could generate uh, a completely accurate graph without it, but it will make your life a little easier, just a, just a heads up. Um, and on problems two and three, the homework refers to LCX and LCY. Remember, LC is just KL, so if you see that, that's, that's what that means. I don't think it's really going to matter, but I just wanted to throw that on there so that everybody was clear with what's going on. Any questions? Okay. Um, today is, uh, so we're going to be going into the process of column design. Um, for those of you that have the FE exam coming up, um, if you have steel on the exam, this is a very possible type of problem on the exam. I, I mean, it's typically the exam uh, for steel will have beam design and column design because of what's provided in the manual and the nature of the problem. This is actually fairly easy to do as well. I mean, if you look at the equations for um, columns versus the equations for tension members, the equations for columns are a lot nastier. Yet the actual process for design is pretty easy. Um, you just have to account for a few details, which we'll discuss today. Um, but I, I would say that things like column design and beam design are why you bought this. Because of all of the design aids and the tools uh, in this, that's why you paid for this. That, that, because you really can't perform column design or beam design without it, yes. Uh, well, I, I'm going to talk about columns. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, let me go back to our, um, let's go back to here. I know I've, I've gone back to here a couple times, because this, but this is basically it in a nutshell. So, we've been looking at columns, and up until now, we've been looking at column analysis. There are three different methods uh, to analyze a column, at least three methods that we've discussed so far. Um, the first is to just use the equations directly out of the manual. Um, when you're using the equations, and really this is true for any of the methods that you're using, is you just have to make sure that you're handling slenderness appropriately. Um, so we looked at uh, an example where the slenderness computation was a little intricate, to say the least. And then we utilize method number one to compute the capacity according to the column curves. 
And then we said, all right, let's look at method two and method three. And method two uh, is, well, both of these methods are really to use a particular uh, design aid in the manual. So method two was utilizing the column capacity table that starts on page 412. Um, the big thing is that whenever you're, um, uh, whenever you're going into this table, you have to uh, identify whether or not you're entering the table looking at strong axis capacity or weak axis capacity. If you're looking uh, up sections according to their weak axis capacity, you just look it up. It's, it's simple. But if you're looking up strong axis capacity, you have to compute this equivalent effective length by taking the strong axis length, the KL in the strong axis, and dividing it by Rx over Ry. And those Rx over Ry ratios are on the bottom. Okay? And we did an example uh, looking at that. We did an example also looking at the KL over R tables or the uh, critical stress tables. Um, it was pretty simple. It's just uh, another means of, of, of checking your, uh, your calculations. Everybody good? Okay, so now let's talk about design. So in design, I'm going to give you a load. You know, here's a column. It's got 500 kips on it. What column works? Okay, so we don't know if it's a W10 by 49 or a W12 by 50. We have no idea. So uh, we mean, that means we need to select a column. That's the whole point of design. So we're going to use table 4.1 because 4.1 lists the capacity for every feasible column uh, as a function of their length. So um, one thing I will point out, this method works for singular columns and for columns and frames. And right now, you probably don't know what I mean, like what's the difference? The big difference between singular columns and columns and frames is the computation of K, your effective length factor. Um, for this assignment, uh, everything is singular columns, so it's, it's, it's pretty easy. You just look K up. Now, the way the procedure works is we're going to determine the design load, determine the uh, 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 effective lengths in either direction. And what you'll do is you'll look up sections based off of the weak axis capacity, and then you will check the strong axis capacity. Now, I'll go ahead and tell you, we have two examples. The first example that we're going to do, we actually aren't going to have to worry about this. And I'll explain why when we get to it. But typically, what you'll have to do is check the, uh, or look up based on the weak axis and check the strong axis. Now, when we look these up, we're going to look up families of shapes. And by families of shapes, I mean uh, you'll, you're going to look up at least one W14, one W12, one W10, and one W8. And so you might look up four shapes, and you might go through and do the analysis and find that they all work. And if they all work, choose the lightest. Okay? So and how do you know which is the lightest? Well, it's the W12 by whatever. If you have a W12 by 50 and a W10 by 49, choose the W10 by 49 because it weighs 49 pounds per foot as opposed to 50. Um, everybody okay with that? All right. So we got two design examples. Okay? Now, we have a, a column that is subjected to a dead load of 150 kips, a live load of 350 kips. We're going to take FY to be 50 KSI, and we've got that the column is pinned on each end, and it is 15 foot long in both directions. So let me, let me highlight a couple things about that. All right. <coughs> so this is a day, by the way, if you don't have your manual out, you should break it out. We're going to be using it. How's it going? Hey. That's a great question. How does this work on the FE? And I will actually, I don't know, I don't have it on my, I don't have it on my drive, but um, the short answer is it's a, uh, the, the design aids that we're talking about are actually in the manual. They're actually there. So I'll, I'll show you. Actually, you know what? Let me see if i got time, and I'll show you that in here in a sec. But let, let me get through the example, and, and we'll pull that up. Um, first off, let, let's keep this simple. Oh. Factored load. We were given a dead load of 150 kips and a live load of 350 kips. Now, we've been through quite a few things in this class, and 
but by now I have got to believe that if you see a service dead load and a service live load, you know what to do with them, right? Y'all know the drill. <laughs> yeah, it's not an FC prime. Yeah. Good. That's what we did in our alternatives report, right? <laughs> so what, is, what does this come out to be? I mean, do I, do I need to, I mean, I, I think by now you all can do this. 740 kips. Do I have a second on that? Okay. We know our yield stress is FY is 50 KSI. And, and I'm going to make a note here. Pay attention to this. Okay, because it's really easy. I, I'm not kidding. It's really easy during a homework or especially during an exam to be looking at the wrong table because the manual, see the manual used to have just 50 KSI tables. Now there's 50, there's 65, so it's really easy to not look at the right one. So just make sure you're paying attention to that. Okay. Now, um, effective lengths. Now, what it said in the problem statement is that this column is 15 feet long and it's pinned in both directions. So what that means is this. Here's the column. Remember we had an x-axis diagram and a y-axis diagram? Remember that? Well, this column is going to be pinned along both directions. So help me out. What is the K value for this case? For either, it's the same case. You should be breaking out your AISC 15th edition steel construction manual and turning to the page that's tabbed that lists all the K values. What is the K value when it's pin pin? Say that? One. Is everybody able to find that on their AISC 15th edition steel construction manual? Seriously, this is a day to have your manual out. So, Is everybody with me? Okay. All right. So here's the deal. Would you agree that... KX, LX is 15 feet. Would you agree that KY, LY is 15 feet? Would you agree with that? Okay. Whenever these two values are the same, we only consider, we only need to consider this. Okay. Here's why. Okay. Remember, we don't really care which segment's longer, what's the K value, or what, what that's not our end, you know, uh, 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 thing that we're checking. The only thing that we really care about is what the KL over R value is, right? The bigger the KL over R, the lower the capacity. Well, both of these segments have the same KL. This is the same KL as this segment. Now, for W shapes, which is bigger, RX, or RY, which is bigger for W shapes, RX or RY. RX, that's the strong axis. The X axis is always the biggest. Everybody's like, I'm just going to say something, and it's going to be like red or black on the roulette table, and we'll see if it's right. 
No, is, there, is everybody okay with that? I mean, look at any W shape and you'll see that Rx is bigger, right? So if Rx is always bigger and these are the same, which has a larger slenderness, the y-axis or the x-axis? Say it again. The y-axis, right? If Ry is smaller and these two are the same, then KL over R is always bigger in the KL over R is always bigger in the y direction. Does that make sense? So because of that, for this example, we only need to look up sections and pick the lightest one. The next example, it's going to get a little more uh, uh, challenging. So let's, let's just go through that process. And then once we go through 16A and B, I think you'll see how this goes about. OK, so so we need to select some trial sections. So here are the values that are important. PU is what 740 and KL in the y direction is 15 feet okay here's what I want you to do I want you to go to table 41 and I want to start with the W14s and I want you to find me the lightest W14 that can safely resist that load Remember, pay attention to your FY, because if you look at the top of the table, it is very easy to be in a table where FY is not 50 KSI. Just pay attention to that. If you don't see green and blue, you're on the wrong table. We're in table 4-1, 4-1A to be precise. This one should be tabbed. Okay, Are you, that's a great question. Are you on table 4-1A? Okay, so we're starting with the W-14s. Okay, so do you see how, here, let me go back to, let me go back to this. This is, this is a fair point. Okay, so you see pages that look something like this, right? So let's say, let's say we were looking for 12s, right? We're looking for a length of 15 feet. So over here is the length, right? Let me ask you this. Would a W12 by 65 work? Well, a W12 by 65 that's 15 foot long has a capacity of 663 kips. Does that work for our problem? I'm asking you. You ask the question, I'm asking you. What's that? What's the load? So would that be an adequate design? No, no, no hold on, don't do the problem. This W12 by 65, if it's 15 foot long, this is how much it can hold up before it's going to fail. It cannot, this would not be an effective design, right? Would the W12 by 72? Would that be an effective design? No. What about the 79? Okay. All right. So now, tell me the W14. I want to uh, tell me which W14 would you pick? The W14 by 90. Now, why did you pick that? What is its capacity? Does that make does that make sense? Because our, the table is listing how much the column can hold up. And the load is 740. So if you put 740 on a column that can only hold up 600, that column is going to fail and kill people. Is everybody with me on that? Yes. The, the, the table is listing capacities based on the weak axis. And since our weak axis and the strong axis are the same, we know that the weak axis is going to govern. This is not going to happen on the next example, so it's going to get a little more intricate. 
Is everybody with me on that? Okay. Now, what about section number two? How about the W-12s? Somebody tell me the W-12. I think I already pointed it out on the, on the screen. What's a W-12 section, that the, the lightest W-12, that will safely resist this load? 79. And you picked that because its VPN was what? Sorry, sorry, what? 809. Okay. What about the W-10s? Is there a W-10 that works? 88. Okay. Why did you pick that? What is its capacity? And what about the W-8s? There isn't one, right? There are no W-8s that would work for this, uh, for this loading. And that's possible. That could happen. Now, I'm telling you, you got three shapes that work. Which one you go with? And which is the lightest? The W12 by 79, right? Remember this is 79 pounds per foot, 88 pounds per foot, 90. The answer for this problem would be 90. No, not necessarily, not necessarily. This, this is a highly nonlinear problem and so don't, don't do that. I mean, it's not necessarily. And let me say one other thing. That is really not the case with beams. Not even close. Like you, what ends up happening is you group your shapes by flexural efficiency, and you know you you would pick this one just based on the math. But you go six or seven shapes up, and that's the lightest. So, but that'll make sense later. So. Everybody with me on this? Okay. All right. Now let's let's ramp it up a bit. Okay. All right. Here's another one. Okay. So this is 16B. So we're going to select the most economical shape to resist a factored load of 890. So I'm giving you the load and I'm giving you the uh, uh, the FY. Now the column is 20 foot long but the bracing conditions are a bit different, okay? I've got different bracing along the x-axis than I do along the y, okay? So here, I'll, I'll transcribe all this information for you here in a sec, but I want to make sure everybody's clear on what's going on. So here's 16B. So we've got a factored load. of 890, Woo. we have FY is 50 KSI, and here's what's going on with the effective length. All right, so our x-axis looks like this. We have a load like this, but on the y-axis, we've got intermediate bracing. We have a brace here, and we have a brace here. Okay. Now, I see nothing but pin-pin segments across the board. So what is K for a pin-pin segment? One. Okay. Now, this dimension over here is 20 feet. And this dimension over here is as follows. 
This is six feet, this is eight feet, and that's six feet. Everybody okay with that? Now, here's the thing. If K is one across the board, then I propose that our design segments are a KX LX of 20 feet, but a KY LY of 8 feet. Now on the Y axis, why am I not considering this and this? Well, this is obviously the longest. Remember, columns get weaker the longer they get. So which segment am I going to check along the Y axis? It's the worst case scenario. But here they're not the same, right? These aren't the same values like they were in the last problem. The x-axis is different than the y-axis, and the x-axis is longer. So which axis governs, the x-axis or the y-axis? I have no idea. I have no idea because I don't know what the column looks like because I'm in design mode. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to pick columns based off of the y-axis. Why am I picking them based off that? Because that's what the tables are written off of. But for each one of those columns, I'm going to have to check the x-axis to see whether or not it's viable. Yes? Well, you'll, you're going to see what we do here. But each shape's different. Look at the Rx over Ry ratios. It'd be different if they were all the same but they're not every shape's different, so you're just going to have to select a family of trial shapes and see which one works. See, that's why we select a family. We make sure and select at least one W14, one W12, one W8, so we know we're getting the, the most economical one. Make sense? Okay, so. So, here, let me, let me blow this up. Okay, so. Let's select some trial shapes. And the key word is trial. We don't know whether or not these are going to work because we're selecting based off of the weak axis and we have to go back and check the strong axis capacity for each of them. Now, we select P off of PU is 890 and a KL in the Y axis of eight feet. So let's start off with the W14. Somebody tell me what W14 you would pick based off of a load of 890 and a KL of eight feet. What's the lightest shape that you can find that works? Eighty-two. I'm hearing an eighty-two. Do I have a second on that? Okay. Now, you selected that based off a capacity of what? 968. And while we're at it, we're going to need it. What is the Rx over Ry ratio? 2.44. Does everybody see where that is? It's on the bottom of the page. Everybody okay with that? Now, for the W12s, what would you go with? The 79. So you're going with the W12 by 79 because it has a VPN of what? 971. And what is its Rx over Ry ratio? 1.75. See, every shape's different, so they're all going to have different Rx over Ry ratios. So, so yeah. So, how about the W10s? 88. I'm. What? All right. You pick that because it has a VPN of what? 9.25. And what is its Rx over Ry ratio? And what about W8s? There are no W8s. Now, okay, before I move on, I want to make sure that everybody's crystal clear on how to select these segments. Is everybody okay with that? Here's the thing, I have no idea whether or not they're going to work. Okay, no idea. 
And, uh, and the only way I'm going to be able to determine that is to do some math. Now, y'all remember linear interpolation, right? Okay, here's the thing. I want you to keep linear interpolation in your mind, but I also want you to be smart about it, okay? Use some common sense. Tell you what, do I have an Expo marker up here? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this in really, ah, well, I'm going to put this in really big letters because I want everybody to keep their eye on the prize with that number right there. The load is 890 kips. Okay, let's try section number one. Okay, now, what I've got to do is I have to evaluate the strong axis capacity. I know that the weak axis works because I selected all of these sections with the understanding that they would have enough capacity along their weak axis. That's what the table tells me. But I don't know whether or not they have enough capacity along their strong axis. So what I have to do is I have to compute that equivalent KL. And the way that I do that is I take KX LX divided by that ratio. So what was KXLX for this problem? 20 feet. Okay. What is RX over RY for this segment? 2.44. Okay. And so what does that equal? Eight point two zero feet. Do I have a second on that? What does this table tell you is the capacity if it's eight point two feet long? It doesn't have an eight point two, right? But it does have an eight and a nine, right? So what is the capacity of this column if the column is eight foot long? And what is the capacity of this column if it's nine foot long. So, hold on. Let's, let's make sure everybody's clear on what we're doing. We've got something in between, right? So, what, what is the capacity for each of these? What's the capacity if this column is eight foot long and what's the capacity if this column is nine foot long? Does everybody understand what I'm asking? Nine sixty-eight and nine forty. Is everybody able to find those values? Don't be embarrassed if you're not. Okay, just raise your hand. Everybody good? Now. Under. My goodness. Don't listen to him. Now, I'm going to ask this question, and he figured it out, but let's see if everybody else does. Would you agree that the capacity, like we're going to have to linearly interpolate to determine the actual value. Now, before you start breaking out your Casio FX115 ES pluses, let me ask you a question. Is it necessary to interpolate? Why? Bam, eye on the prize. It doesn't matter what the actual value is. We know that it's going to be between 968 and 940, and that's bigger than this. So does this shape work? Yes. So here, so, all right. The W14 by 18, or W14 by 82, is good. Okay. Yes. That, that's a good question. Um, so the question was, can we just start with the, the lightest one and work upwards? Yes, you can. Um, 
typically experience has shown me that you're going to be doing this more if you do that. If you start with the deeper sections and work your way down, you end up iterating less, but you are it's it's a valid option. Let me also say this. In Microsoft Excel land, it wouldn't matter. So is everybody okay with that? Now, let me say something else. Let me say let me follow that up. Okay. The neck what is the next shape? W12 by 79. Okay, to follow up on your question, what if it was a W12 by 89? Would there be any reason to check it? Why are you shaking your head no? Because the other one's lighter. Exactly right, you know. There's no point in checking a W12 by 89 because the W14 by 82 is lighter. No point in wasting your time. But is there a reason to check this shape now? Yes, because if it works, it's lighter than the W14 by 82. Is, is everybody okay with that? Okay. Now, hold on. In order to do this, it's the same process. An equivalent KL RX over RY. What was the RX over RY for this segment? 1.75. And so what is this? What? 4.2? Oh, you are getting overruled, my man. Well, let me say this. There's act like you're going to see here in a second where actually being a little specific matters. I mean, you don't need to get it to 12 decimal places, but all right. So everybody agrees that like the table doesn't list 11.4, or 42, or 43, but it does list 11 and 12, right? So let's look up the capacity for 11 feet. And let's look up the capacity for 12 feet. So 9, 10, and this is what? 887. All right, let me ask you this. Should we interpolate this one? You're, All right, all right. That's a fair point. We're three kits away from our, our capacity of the 12 foot. It's not 111. No, it should be a little below 910. All right. Look, look. I'll say this. In FE exam land, I'd probably follow your, your logic. I'm going to go ahead and interpolate just because it's in between. And since we didn't know whether or not we were 0.42 or 0.43, I'm going to go ahead and do it. Now, we've done linear interpolation before. Oh, I, I, so we're, we're going to do the first number plus change in y. Is it over change in X? And then that's I'm being <laughs> Did, Do I got seconds on that? Yep. All right. Is this column viable? Yes. yes, this is a viable column. So I would say that the W14, or sorry, the W12 by 79 is good. 
Now our next and, and final column that we have so far is the W10 by what? Is it worth it to check this column? Yes, because if it works, this column is lighter than what we would... Hold on, hold on, stop. Everybody pay attention, pay attention. If we didn't do anything else, which column would you select? Column number one or column number two? Two. two. So we know right off the bat that if we didn't do any other math, we could pick number two and we'd be fine. We have a candidate, though, that's lighter, so we should check it to see whether or not it's, it's uh, valid. So we have an equivalent KL. Um, equals 20 feet over, what was this? And that's what? 11.56 feet. So um, we're going to look up capacities between KL is 11 feet and capacities between KL is 12 feet, or capacity between 11 and 12. So what are these values? Now, here's a question. Should we waste our time interpolating? Because we know whatever value we get, is this column going to be good? No, this column is no good. So, to summarize, what's our final answer? Boom. Yes. Uh, I'm just saying that, that I'm just, it's not really a matter of like, can I give you an example as, as to which one would work. It's really just a matter of, really, I can't really explain it better than experience. It's just, if you look at the properties of W10s, W12s, and W14s, I've just found on experience that if I started the W14s and worked down, on average, I'm iterating less. I don't. No, no, but what I can say is this, and, and I did want to uh, discuss this before we close out. Um, I have a couple things I want to discuss. First off, we have a W10 by 77 is no good. What if we found that all these shapes were no good? <laughs> no, I mean, no, I'm saying the building is the building. The column's 15 foot long and... what? Say what? You're just going to go back to the table and look up the next heaviest one and do it again. So instead of the W14 by 82, pick the W14 by 90. Pick the W12 by 87 or whatever. Just pick the next one. And so you might have to iterate this a few times. Let me say this. The times that you have to do a lot of iteration with this is when there's really big differences between KLX and KLY. When those two values get far apart, that means you usually have to do a lot of iteration. So uh, if those values are, are far apart from one another, then yeah, you're going to have to do some iteration. Now, hold on. You asked a question, and I, I really want to really address this. So yeah. Sorry, say it again. Yes. Yes. Because, like for shape two, we could, yeah. Okay. Okay, what was I doing? Okay, log into my account. I don't remember doing that. 
Đâu cũng nó nè I don't remember what my account is. All right, this is close enough. Hold, hold on, everybody, you got one? Uh, a reference handbook for the FE exam. This is version 9.2. It's a little bit older, but you had asked a question about the FE exam. Yeah. It might, might help if, if, if y'all were paying attention. All right. So I'm scrolling down to the civil engineering section. Everybody, pay attention, pay attention. So first off, I'm in, like, so this is concrete design. You should recognize some of this from reinforced concrete, you know, ASFYD minus A over 2, all that. Now here I am in steel design. Now some of this in steel design you won't recognize right off the bat because it's, it, you know, you haven't seen this. But some of it you should because, you know, like effective net area and shear lag factors and, and all of that. Here are some of the tables that are present in the manual. So one of them is actually just the, the section properties. So, you know, it, what, the, what the manual does, is it just selects a small subset of shapes. Uh, so it starts with W24 by 68s and goes down to like W10 by 39s and it lists all the fundamental properties. Um, there are some tables from the manual that are sort of clipped in. Uh, and, and reduced a bit. You don't know what this table is yet. This is for beams. You don't know what this is yet. This is for beams. But you should recognize this, effective length factors for columns. You'll be using this uh, here soon. We have the KL over R tables. This was the method number three. And look right here. This is method number two. So these are exactly what we've been looking at. So if you have, let's say, a W12 by 74, Here's the KL and here's the capacities. That's in the manual. No. In design, you're always using method two. You're always using the tables. You're, the, all the KL over R tables do is help you with the math. That's all, like checking your math and making sure your math uh, is correct. And if you look up in the equations up here, you know, you can see the equations are there. So, so yeah, every, everything is here. So, any questions? All right, I have one other quick thing to highlight. We'll talk about this next week. And this is columns in frames. And so I just want to highlight what we're going to be talking about. We've been talking about columns as if they were just by themselves in a building, just a column by itself. And for most of the columns in structures, that's fine. The only time that that's not okay is when you are looking at the columns in the braced frame or the moment frame. Remember, remember the seat belt analogy? We don't design the entire car to hold you back. We design a certain system in the car to hold you back in the event of a crash. We call that system a seat belt. Well, we don't design the entire building to withstand wind and size, but we design a small subsystem. Okay? So, um, what we're going to be looking at are the brace frame and the moment frame columns. So if here's a brace frame, I'm really only talking about these columns right here. If I'm talking about a moment frame, it's kind of difficult to see on this image, but can everybody see how these columns here, here, and here look a little different than these? They're a little beefier, and the connections look pretty intense because you've got all these plates all over the place. Those are the moment frame columns that are holding the entire building up under a, a wind or an earthquake event. And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be concerning ourselves with how do we compute K for that column. Once we figure that out, nothing changes. Every single thing that we've talked about up until now, using method 2, going into table 4, 1, computing the capacity, all that's the same. The only difference is how do you get K? And so if you're looking at, um, at some of these shapes, like for instance if we're looking at a brace frame, well, K isn't really a value. We know it's somewhere in between some values. And so how we determine that takes a few more design aids and a few more dis uh, points of discussion that we will talk about on Monday. Yes? How much? What? Um, 
I would say the short answer is it's, it's usually a mix of the two. So for instance, a very common connection in a building to connect regular beams to regular columns is a shear connection. And so usually there's a hip bone connected to the leg bone analogy. The beam is connected to a plate that's connected to the column. So you might have that plate welded along to the column and then it's bolted in the field. Um, same thing here. You have this moment connection. You have the uh, plate welded to the girder and then it's bolted to the column. So usually it's both. You could have just bolts. You could have like an angle and you bolt everything. Um, welding everything with beams and columns, that usually never happens because then you'd have to truck an entire frame to site. And that, yeah, that, that ain't going to work. Sound good? We talk about columns and frames on Monday. Y'all have a wonderful weekend.